30 years ago, what was the richest country in Latin America? Venezuela. What happened to make the richest country in Latin America on a per capita GDP basis the poorest country in Latin America? Basically socialism, not just the oil industry. They took over the entire supply chain of food. They, they collectivized farming. They did a bunch of things. They basically embraced statism, socialism, fascism, however you want to call it. They embraced it. State control of the means of production in one form or another. Went from the richest country in Latin America to the poorest. Who was the poorest country in Latin America 30 years ago? Poorer than Nicaragua 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. Chile. Who's the richest country in Latin America today? Chile. Why? How did they go from poorest to richest? They did exactly the opposite of what Venezuela did. They embraced capitalism. Elements of it, not as pure as I would like, not as free as I would want. But even a little bit of capitalism goes a long way. They privatized. They deregulated. They lowered taxes. They took all those companies that own the natural resources and privatized them. And Chilean economy went like that. So Chile, here's a country, Chile, who's become the richest country in Latin America because they embraced elements of capitalism. Venezuela became the poorest country in Latin America because they embraced socialist principles. What do you think the people of Latin America want? Capitalism or socialism? Do they want to be rich or do they want to be poor? Well, by every indication, they want to be poor. Because in the last round of voting, with the exception of Argentina, every single country in Latin America voted for socialists. Now that's head-scratching and weird and bizarre. How can that be? People don't really want to be poor, and yet somehow they can't bring themselves to vote for capitalism. Even in Chile, where they've first-handedly experienced this, the last presidential vote, I think it's two and a half years ago, three years ago, they voted in a socialist to undo all the things that made them rich so they could become poor again. Of course, that's not how they think about it, but that's the consequence. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the appeal of socialism? And what is it about capitalism that so repels us? It's not whether it works or not. People pretend it is. I mean, Paul Krugman pretend cap pretends capitalism doesn't work. He knows better. Almost all economists do. But why pretend? Why not just advocate for the thing that makes us rich? You'd think that would be straightforward and simple. American economic growth rates have declined systematically as we become more statist, as we become more interventionist, as we have moved away from capitalism. That happens, again, in every country you can see out there. The fact that capitalism works and it's a huge success is, should be obvious. So why do we hate capitalism? And what is it about socialism we love? What is capitalism about? That wasn't really a question. That was, I mean, I'll ask real questions, but I also ask real ones. What's capitalism about? This is a real question. What is capitalism about? Like, what, what are we doing capitalism? What, what, how, how, how do people act in capitalism? For, for example, like, what are, what are markets about? What, when, when Steve Jobs builds the iPhone, right, why does he do it? What's he doing it for? Who's he doing it for? Why, why does Apple sell iPhones? To make money. So first, to make money. And that was pretty quick. Usually I get like 10 responses before somebody will say, somebody has to, everybody's thinking it, but nobody has the guts to say make money. Because to say make money, it's a little embarrassing. We're a little, and this goes to the heart of the problem. Right? Apple makes this to make money. Now, is it only about money? Right? Steve Jobs, who created the iPhone, right? did he do it just for the money? Was it just about money? What else? What else? Why did he do it? Did, yeah, really? He really cared about me? He wanted to make me better? I doubt it. He never asked me what I wanted. Did Apple run any customer surveys? Did it ask the customers what they wanted? No. They didn't care. Why did Steve Jobs build this? 
What's that? Yeah, to get ahead of competition, but then it's just about the money again, right? Why do you want to get ahead of competition to make money? But, but there's something else. Right? Steve Jobs didn't wake up every morning and say, I want to make a lot of money. That's not what motivated him. What motivated him? Need a need? Nobody needed iPhones. Right? That's a fallacy in economics. You don't need iPhones until Steve Jobs teaches you that you need an iPhone. Like Henry Ford, I was just at the Henry Ford School in Detroit, gave a talk there. Ford once said, if I had asked my customers what they want, they would have said a faster horse, a better buggy. Not a single customer would have said a car, an automobile. Entrepreneurs create stuff and they teach us that we need it. Steve Jobs made this because he loved Because he loved building beautiful things. Because he wanted to see the things that he imagined come into being and be used by people. He loved the idea of this. He went to work every day filled with excitement and joy because he got to create, he got to play, right, at creating stuff that was beautiful, effective. He was motivated. So Steve Jobs, in the end, built the iPhone for whom? For himself. Because he loved it and because he wanted to make a lot of money from it. But Steve Jobs built it for himself. Now, I remember the first iPhone I bought. It was 2008. The U.S. economy was spiraling into recession. And I, a good student of Keynes, the economist, I wanted to help stimulate the U.S. economy. So I went and bought an iPhone because I knew that if I bought an iPhone, Keynes taught that consumption drives the economy, so I wanted to consume. Right? I know that's why you go shopping because you care about your fellow man because you want to make sure people have jobs. Some of you are not smiling. You look like you're taking this too seriously. I mean, nobody goes shopping because of that. Why do you go shopping? Yeah, well, for yourself, because you want stuff. Because you want to make your life better. I went and bought, bought an iPhone because I thought it was it would be cool. It would make me more productive. It would be a, something fun to do, right? Turned into a lot more than I thought it was. But that's why I bought it. So we all go into the marketplace as producers and consumers. We go into the marketplace for what purpose? To pursue what? Exchange for what? What? Happiness is removed, immediate. What are we doing? We're pursuing what? Yeah, I know you can't. It, 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 it's not obvious, which is surprising, right? We're pursuing our self-interest. We're going into the marketplace because I want to get stuff that I think will make my life better, that I think will lead to my happiness. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but I think it will. And I'm selling stuff in the marketplace because I'm trying to make money, because I want to feed my family, and I want to invest, and I want to buy beautiful things, and I want to improve my life in order to be happy. The marketplace is a place in which we go to pursue our own self interest. The marketplace is a place that doesn't care about the social world, doesn't care about, you know, the common good. It doesn't care about all these things. It cares about individuals pursuing their self-interest. Adam Smith understood this, right? In the, in the, in the Wealth of Nations, you write, the baker doesn't bake his bread, the bread, for you. He doesn't know you, doesn't really care that much about you. He loves baking bread, and he's trying to earn his living. He's trying to feed his family. He's doing it for self-interested reason. And you don't buy the bread, with all due respect, in order so the baker can feed his family. You're buying the bread so you can eat it because you need it for you. So marketplaces are places in which we go in order to pursue our self-interest. Everything about capitalism is about self-interest. People pursuing their self-interest. Indeed, why do we want freedom? We want freedom so that we can pursue our self-interest based on our values, based on our what we believe will lead to our own individual happiness. So let me ask you, what did your mother teach you about being self-interested? Or let's use a little bit of a harsher word. Self-interest is too nice of a word. What did your mother teach you about being selfish? Which is the same as self-interest just has a little bit of negative social connotation, but it's all the same, right? It's about pursuing your self-interest. Your mother taught you it was good, right? You should always pursue your self-interest. 
No. My mother taught me, think of others first. Think of yourself last. She didn't mean it. No mother means it. She wanted me to be successful. And to be successful, you have to think about yourself. But our whole moral code, our whole ethical code, is about thinking of first, never thinking about yourself. Indeed, to be virtuous is to be self selfless. Not think about the self at all. In, in ordinary terms, when I, you, know, you listen to the news, you listen to things, if anybody has ever talked about positively, oh, they did it for selfless reasons. That is down here. And that means that capitalism is always down here. Because it's all about being self-interested. Now, interestingly enough, it's not about exploiting other people. It's not about other people being worse off because what is the nature of trade, which is the essence of capitalism, right? We pursue our self-interest through trade. And trade is what? It's mutually beneficial. It's win-win. If I buy an iPhone for $1,000, why am I giving up $1,000 for an iPhone? Because I believe I'll be better off with an iPhone than with $1,000. I win. Does that mean Apple lost? No, their profit margins are huge. They made a profit, and I made a profit. My profit has to be, happens to be, in economics terms, consumer surplus, right? How much this is worth to me more than the $1,000 I spent on it? Anybody have any idea how much this is worth to me more than $1,000? How much more? A lot. Like this is like tens of thousands of dollars. Can't really put a number on it. It's so valuable to me. Don't tell Apple. I don't want them to raise my price. I mean, I couldn't have imagined being able to video conference with my kids from anywhere in the world, tell them bedtime story by video at a marginal cost of zero. Can't imagine. I, I remember vinyl records. I know they're hot again, but now you have options. My day, all you had was vinyl records. Now I can access every piece of music ever, ever recorded and produced on this thing at a marginal cost of zero. And you could go on and on. And I found this place using maps, which I used to have to open up paper maps. Some of you might remember, a few of you. Uh, disaster, you know, particularly in this weather, having to open a map, watch and drive and all of that, now trivial. It's unbelievable what this is valuable to me. Right? So I want Apple one. So pursuing your self-interest, I was pursuing my self-interest in buying it. Apple was pursuing their self-interest in selling it. We both won. And yet self-interest is considered beneath contempt. We have a moral code that really has elevated selflessness, which means self-sacrifice, which means giving up self. That is the most moral thing. And that doesn't happen in capitalism. Not as part of the system. Indeed, self-interest is what is incentivized and motivated and everything. And it's not about how many people you help, right? We, 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 we have this idea that, no, we want this nice system uh, where the focus morally is on other people to help other people. Who helps people the most? Who has benefited mankind the most? By helping, who's raised people out of poverty the most? Capitalists, businessmen, financiers. That's what's elevated capitalism. That's what elevated the poor. How do the poor get, become middle class? By work. Who provides the work? Entrepreneurs, businessmen. Who provides the goods that raise our standard of living? Businessmen. It's business, it's exchange, it's mutual free exchange. It's capitalism that has elevated our lives materially. So why doesn't capitalism get credit for all the benefit it does others? Which is how Adam Smith pursued it. Adam Smith thought about it. He thought, yes, we're all kind of selfish as individuals, and that's bad. But it turns out this, this magic, call it the invisible hand, that turns all our selfish activities into a social good. But the reality is nobody believes that, right? So you add up a bunch of vices, like everybody's doing these vices, and you add them up and you get something good, 
That doesn't make any sense. So capitalism is immoral. I'll give you another example, hopefully to illustrate that. Uh, it's an example I've been using for years. I know maybe it's a little dated because people's perception of this guy is a little dated. But uh, let's forget about all the conspiracy theories and all the stories, uh, at least since COVID, about Bill Gates. Remember, Bill Gates is the founder of Microsoft. Bill Gates founded Microsoft, right? Did he help other people? Did he help people? Yeah. Pretty much every person on the planet, literally every person on the planet, even somebody like me who only uses Apple products, has benefited from the existence of Microsoft. Microsoft changed the world. It changed every aspect of our world. By bringing a PC to every desk, it changed the way we do everything we do. Even the aid that we provide, the poorest people in Africa, who've never seen a computer gets to them because of the ability of a, a, to do supply chain through a computer, through a Microsoft product. So Bill Gates has basically made the lives of almost everybody on planet Earth better by founding, running Microsoft and becoming the richest man in the world. And what do we think about him? Hate his guts. He's rich. We don't like him. Now, when does Bill Gates become... Somewhat likable. Not too much, but somewhat likable. When he leaves Microsoft, he takes, all, he takes a bunch of his money and puts it into a foundation and starts giving it away. Then he's okay. He, we don't love him yet. We'll get to why in a minute. But he's okay. So in other words, let's get this right, right? To build something, to create something, to employ people, to change the world, to, 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 to trade with people in mutual beneficial trade with billions of people around the world, that morally, eh. But to give the money away, that's good. What's the difference? The fundamental difference is that when he was in business, he was benefiting. And when he's a philanthropist, he's not benefiting. So the fact that he didn't benefit changes whether an action is good or bad. Not, it's not about helping other people. Business helps more people than philanthropy every single day. But philanthropy is good because the person who's helping is not benefiting. This is why socialism is so attractive. Socialism distributes wealth. Socialism is about giving people stuff. And the person who gives doesn't, doesn't make any money off of giving it. And socialism... You know, you, you don't trade, so you don't gain. It's all about redistribution. Everybody's poor, really poor, but so be it. That's a sacrifice you have to make in order to be moral. Why isn't Bill Gates loved? Like, why, why, why can't we make Bill Gates a saint? What's the problem, even now that he's doing philanthropy? There's some problem with Bill Gates, even when he just does philanthropy and he's not running a business anymore. What, what, what prevents him from being, being a saint? He's still super rich. That's right. He's got a lot of money. And not only does he have a lot of money, he's got a big house. You know, he has a room in his house. The whole room is a trampoline. I, mean, I think that's so cool. I wish I had a room that was a trampoline, particularly when I was younger. Maybe not so much today. I'm not sure my back could take it. But... How, how can somebody who has a trampoline room be moral? There's no way. Not according to my mother's system of morality. Not according to our preachers and our philosophers' system of morality. There's no way. He's rich, and he's also having fun. That's a no-no, big no-no. He seems to enjoy giving the money away. He seems to enjoy his investments. You're not supposed to enjoy doing moral things. You ever gone to a museum and what, see paintings of saints? They're not enjoying themselves. They usually got arrows sticking inside of them and suffering some horrible death somewhere by torture. We have a morality that says that suffering, sacrifice, giving stuff up, self-denial, those are virtuous and moral. And that Making something, producing, 
getting rich, benefiting your own life, having fun, emo. That's bad. Not compatible with capitalism. Capitalism is about the eating making, not about the suffering. So I contend that the problem is the reason we're moving away from capitalism is not because of any failing of capitalism. Capitalism does, produces the goods. The problem is that we have a morality that's inconsistent with it. And you could say, well, I've got an economic system and a morality that are inconsistent. I have to give up on one of them. Most people give up on the capitalism. They keep their moral system. Because morality trumps economics every single time. We'd rather be good than rich. We'd rather be good than pretty much anything else. Ayn Rand argued that what we should really be doing is questioning our moral system. That our morality is probably wrong. Our morality is probably off. She asks a simple question. You say we should be living for others, that other people are more important than me. And I ran to ask why. Really simple question. Why? I am me. Should I be the most important thing to me? Isn't my life the standard for everything that I do? Why? Should I live for other people? And then they live for other people, and then they live for other people. How does that end? Capitalism has shown us that if I live for myself, and I pursue my self-interest, and I pursue my self-interest through mutual trade, if I pursue my self-interest through win-win transactions, I'm better off. I'm much better off. Materially, but I would argue also spiritually in every sense, and so is everybody else. Isn't a win-win society, isn't a win-win relationship-based society better than a sacrificial one in which one party necessarily loses, which is a lose-win relationship? I don't know how many lose-win relationships you've ever been in, but lose relationship always turn into lose-lose relationship. Why don't we just emphasize the win-win? Why isn't that the basis of social interaction? Not the sacrifice. Not the selflessness, but the opposite, the self-interest. So instead of being selfless as being virtuous, maybe selflessness is a vice, and maybe self-interest is the virtue. Maybe it's all upside down. And Rand argues that it is. That the real virtue is living. Living well. Living to your fullest capacity as a human being. Making the most of the one life you have on this planet. Making the most of every minute, every second that you're alive, because you'll never get it back. And how do you maximize it? What is the way in which human beings should live? What is the tool that makes us human and that makes it possible for us to live well? What is the thing we should pursue if we want to live a great life? What makes us human? It's always a fun question to ask. What's that? Making mistakes. We suddenly make mistakes. There's no question about that. But is that what defines us as human beings? What is, makes it possible for us to make mistakes? Because you're right, animals don't make mistakes. And the question is, why do animals not make mistakes and we make mistakes? That's where you'll get to the essence. Right? We have free will. Suddenly. Free will that facilitates what? What makes it possible for us to have these amazing chairs, this beautiful room, the car that I drove here in, the music of Beethoven, the, the lighting that's in my eyes, the videotape that's going. What makes all that possible? The things that we live every day. Innovation, yeah, but where does innovation come from? Innovation just happened. What's that? What makes human beings human? I mean, this is what's fascinating to me. This should be like, you should have the answer I like that. Yeah, that's rationality. It's ability to think. Ability to conceptualize. And that's why we make mistakes. Because we're not programmed to know the truth. We don't get the truth through some kind of automatic system, in a sense, as animals.
to do. We have to analyze it. We have to think about it. We have to weigh. We have to integrate. And that's all prone to errors. That's all can be error. But of course, reason is the one way in which we fix our errors. So we can make mistakes, but then we can fix them. How do you fix them? By thinking more deeply about it, by getting more facts, by integrating it better. What makes human beings human is our capacity to reason, our capacity to think, our capacity to be rational. Some people think it's thumbs. It's not thumbs. Everything that's here was made by the human mind. We're not programmed even at the very, very most basic level. Now, I know this is Michigan, but how many of you think you have the genes for hunting? Some of you will probably raise your hand. You don't. You don't. I put you in a, in a different environment outside of Michigan. I put you in the middle of the Amazon. You don't instinctually know what to do. You don't know what to do. Now, you can figure it out because you've got a mind. So you can figure out what plants are poisonous or what, what animals are easy to catch and which are not. You'll build weapons, you'll build tools, and you'll survive. But not by using your instinct, by using your mind. We're a pathetic animal from an animal perspective. If you look around this room, you can see that. You guys are weak, you're slow, you don't have any fangs, you don't have claws. You're pathetic. Like, well, run down a bison and bite into it. You can't even catch it. Never mind control it once you've caught it. Right? Or put you against a saber-toothed tiger. Who wins? Now, you think the saber-toothed tiger is. Would. But look, you're here, and the saber-toothed tiger, last one I saw was in a museum somewhere, who lived thousands of years ago because we beat him. How do we do that? Using our mind. We built traps, we built weapons, we out-strategized, we worked in teams and communicated with one another. So we figured it out. That's what makes us human. Ability to think conceptually, to plan, to think into the future, to organize and to build weapons, to change the world, to innovate. But innovation is a product of reason. So if you're going to be self-interested, you know, people think self-interest is what? What do, what do we typically think if I say somebody's selfish? What do I usually mean by that? Well, I care about myself, but I don't think I fit the, 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 the view of selfish that most of us have. They don't care for others, and therefore they're willing to do what? Pretty much anything to get their way, right? They'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal, they'll stab people in the back. They will do whatever it takes to get their way. That's what we conceive of when we think about self-interest or selfish. Is somebody bad, somebody will do whatever to get their way. And yet, if you understand that human beings are rational beings, then to be self-interested is to do what is rational. And if I think about what I'm doing, if I plan long-term, if I consider the effects of my actions, then lying, cheating, stealing are really self-destructive. If you don't believe me, some of you are young, don't have experience with this, maybe you've never lied before, try it. Like take a boyfriend, girlfriend, and lie to them all day. See what happens. Won't last. It screws you. Lying doesn't help. It hurts. Lying's not self-interested. It's self-destructive. So is cheating. So is stealing. Self-destructive. You know, one of the biggest cheats in American business in the last 20 years was a guy named, uh, the, what's that? Bernie Madoff. Thank you. Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he like stole $62 billion, right? Unbelievable sums of money from his friends, from his family. He basically had an investment fund, and he wasn't investing. It was just all paper, all pretend, right? Was Bernie happy when he stole all that money? No, he was miserable. He was literally miserable. He was constantly worried about being caught, constantly frustrated by the fact that this is the way he had to earn a living and what it said about him and his 
capacity, ability to take care of himself. Constantly worried that his family would find out. When he was caught, it wasn't the SEC that caught him. It wasn't the police who caught him. It wasn't the government who caught him. Indeed, massive failure of the government and the SEC to catch him because they were warned. It was his son who caught him. Humiliating. Son called the police on him. When he was in jail, years later, he said, I'm happier in jail than I was before I was caught. You steal your money, you destroy your soul. You destroy yourself, you destroy your integrity, you destroy who you are, and you know you're a complete and utter fake, and you cannot be happy. Lying, cheating, stealing, SOBs are not happy people. Stalin was not happy. Cheats out there in the business world or in any world are not happy. Our soul, our mind is a rational mind. It needs facts. It needs reality. Stealing, lying, cheating are negations of that reality. So a morality of self-interest would be a morality that excludes lying, cheating, stealing, being an SOB, not caring about others. Well, of course I care about others. Why? Well, some of them are my customers. I need to care about my customers. Otherwise, not going to be good at business. Some of them, if I can be crude, I want to have sex with. I should care about them if I'm going to have a relationship like that. Some of them I want to be friends with. I should care about them because I want to have a friendship relationship with them. Right? I care about other people because I want a relationship with them. I want to be able to, in a sense, trade with them. I want to engage in win-win transactions. That's what elevates me. And that's what being selfish is, what being self-interested is, is looking for those win-win relationships. It's using your mind, being rational, being honest, having integrity, being productive, taking care of yourself, not being, if I'm, if I'm you know, a parasite on somebody else, my parents, for example, you're never going to be happy unless you can actually stand on your own two feet, unless you can produce the stuff that you consume, unless you know that you are able to live on this earth by your own main means, by your own talents, by your own ability. So Rand offers us a new morality, a morality of rational self-interest, a morality that says we engage with other people on the basis of trade, on the basis of win-win relationships. It's a morality of self-esteem, of people who want to live their lives based on their own judgment, their own minds, in pursuit of their own values, hoping to achieve their happiness. That is their goal. It's a morality that says that you need to think about what you want in life and how to get it and how to pursue it, and that you should be free to do so. So it's a morality that requires freedom. Nobody can impose their will on me. I have a mind. I get to choose. I get to decide what I want to do. You don't get to tell me what kind of work to do, but you shouldn't be able to tell me what I eat, what I drink, what, how much I pay my employees, what products I produce and what I don't, who to sell it to, how much to sell it at. Not my business. I'll do what I want. It's my life. It's not your life. It's not the government's life. It's not society's life. It's my life. And therefore, I should make decisions about my life. It's a morality that says that's your responsibility, is to make decisions about your life. And somebody like that, who believes strongly in living their own life for their own happiness, they want capitalism not because it's some sophisticated economic system. They want capitalism because capitalism is the only economic system that leaves them free to do exactly that. All capitalism does is say, what protects you from crooks and thieves and fraudsters? Other than that, do what you want. Live your life. We're not going to regulate you. We're not going to control you. We're not going to tell you what's good or what's bad. You get to decide. And I think in a world of self-interested individuals who value their own life, who have self-esteem and who want to live by their own principles, capitalism becomes self-evident. 
They don't want Mother Government sitting on their shoulder saying, don't, don't, don't drink that soda. I mean, they might decide not to drink the soda, but then it's their decision based on their mind. So if we want capitalism, that is the spirit we have to recapture. If we want capitalism, if we want the benefits of capitalism, we need a different morality. We need a real moral revolution. And moral revolutions a thousand times harder than political economic revolutions. And that's why it's so hard to convince people about the benefits of capitalism. Not because we don't have the facts, not because we don't have the economics, not because we don't have the history. All of those aside, it's because we're not willing to argue morality. And it's time we started to do that. After all, there's a sense in which this country was based, founded on that morality, as inconsistent as the founding was. The founding document says we all have an inalienable right to what? Our own life, our own liberty, and in the most selfish, self-interested political statement in all of human history, each one of us has an inalienable right to pursue our own happiness. Thank you. All right, so I will take questions. You guys have some prepared questions? Go for it. But we don't just have to prepare questions. Anybody who wants to ask a question, yell it from where you all, repeat it for the microphone, and we'll also take it from there. Um, can capitalism really lift everyone out of poverty through hard work? If so, why do we have so many poor people after several generations of capitalist development? All right, so a few things I would say to that. One is, as I said at the beginning, we've never really had capitalism. So there would be a lot fewer poor people, maybe no poor people in the world today, or at least in America today, if we truly had capitalism. Second, you're assuming you, you, there's an assumption in the question. If capitalism can bring everybody out of poverty through hard work, not everybody works hard. Not everybody wants to work hard. Not everybody's willing to work hard. Third, as poor as people are in the United States today, they're only poor on a relative scale. They're poor relative to the middle class and the rich. But the poor in the United States are significantly richer than the poor in many other countries in the world. They're significantly richer than the rich were 200 years ago. I mean, most poor in the United States, I think the numbers are 70, 80, 90 percent have a, a, a conditioning, they have automobiles, they have iPhones, or the equivalent of iPhones. That's not poverty in an absolute sense. That's nowhere near the $2 a day or less that 95% of humanity was living under and 8% still lives under. So if you want to get people out of poverty, capitalism is the only system that's ever brought them out. What we need is more consistent, consistent capitalism. And you have to realize that in every society, there will always be inequality. There will always be some people poorer than other people because they're less productive, because they work less hard. For whatever reason, there are always going to be those differences. But, you know, if you, take, if you take today, I don't know, whatever GDP per capita is today, whatever income is today, let's say income is today, um, a, a, somebody poor in the United States, let's say income is about uh, uh, $25,000 a year. Okay. Somebody poor in the United States making 2,000 bucks a month, something around that. Now imagine the economy grew, and I, you know, I don't know, I should pull out my calculator, but imagine the economy grows at 2% uh, a year for the next 40 years. So 1.02, oops, I need to go this way. 1.02 to the power of 40, that's not right. Anybody do this calculation? You know what I'm trying to do? Yeah, so in 40 years, that $25,000 in real terms, if we go 2% real, would be something like 12x. So they wouldn't be making 25 Thousand? How much would they be working? Let's say it's 10x. Let's say they'd be making $250,000 a year. At $250,000 a year, is there anybody poor? Remember, this is real growth. This is above inflation. No. $250,000 a year, you wouldn't call yourself poor today. 
Imagine the growth rate is not 4% or 5%. It's exponential. So it's not just double. It's many times that number. And now, that's the difference between capitalism and statism. Today, we grow at 2% a year. Under capitalism, we could go at 4 to 5% a year. At 4 to 5% a year, you get rid of the, the, anybody making 25,000 a year, you get rid of that within a generation. And within a generation, you don't have poor people. So yes, capitalism does eradicate poverty if we view it from an absolute sense rather than a relative sense. All right, other questions? You guys are shy in Michigan? We have a couple more prepared. Go, go from there, yeah. until um, these guys loosen up a little bit. Most supporters of capitalism see greed as human flaw. Do you agree? Would you rather live in a place where everyone is selfish? Where your neighbors are willing to help you if you suffer an accident and can't work. If family or team thrive and its members are selfish, is charity or giving wrong? Is it moral to ignore those who are poor because they were born with disabilities or developed All right, so that's a lot of questions. Um, so do I think that greed is bad? It really depends on what you mean by greed. If greed means I want more, and I want more, and I want more, then it's pretty good. I want more, and next year I want even more. And it's a motivator. Um, it motivates business. If just the seeking more is what greed is, then it's a good thing. If greed means wanting more and willing to do anything to get it, i.e. immoral stuff, lying, cheating, stealing, then of course it's bad. So it really depends on how you define what greed actually is. But there's a, there's a wonderful speech in the uh, movie Wall Street. I don't know if you've seen the movie Wall Street. Um, uh, where the villain gives a great speech on greed, and he's absolutely right. Where he talks about greed is good. He talks about what greed does and how it motivates and how it creates and how it builds and how it does all these things. Now, it's in, this, it's in the mouth of the villain, so the movie doesn't agree with that. It thinks it's the opposite. It was it, the movie Wall Street was directed by Oliver Stone, who's a Marxist. So he doesn't like capitalism. But the speech is a pretty good speech, and it basically says, look, you know, you, you're all ambitious, hopefully. You want to get a good job? When you get a good job, you want to get a raise? You want to become a manager? You want to become a CEO one day? Is that greed? If that's greed, then it's good. You know, we could call it ambition. If greed crosses the line where you're literally willing to do anything, then sure. But then, you know, it, greed is bad in, in love. Greed is bad in any aspect if you're willing to cross that line. But ambition is always good. So that was one. Second, would I rather live in a society of everybody is selfish and nobody would help a neighbor out when he got into trouble, something like that? Yeah, first of all, I'd love to live in a society where everybody was selfish. I would, God, that is my biggest wish, is to live in such a society. Because that's a society in which everybody takes care of themselves. Everybody is self-sufficient. Everybody is focused on creating win-win relationships. Everybody deals with the people they want to deal with and doesn't deal with the people they don't want to deal with. It's a society of producers and creators and builders. It's a society in which I'm much richer than I am and all of you are too. And it's a society where we're not riddled that the culture with guilt about our successes, which most people over the age of 40 are. You're too you're successful, but you haven't given away enough money. You haven't done this, you haven't done that. Guilt is everywhere in our society. If you take away guilt, people are so much happier. There's a society of happy people. But then you add something, right? A society in which they wouldn't help their neighbor. Why wouldn't they help their neighbor? So is, is a society in which people are pursuing their own self interest a society where you wouldn't help your neighbor? Now, if he's nasty, horrible person, yeah, I'm not helping him. And that's the thing about self-interest. It's conditional. All your relationships are conditional. But if they're basically a decent person, fall on a bad luck, and have, of course I'd help him. I'd help him because any self-interested human being values human life. They value human relationship. They don't want to see human suffering because they cherish life. Life is a beautiful thing. Hey, we take care of plants because we value life. We take care of pets because we value life. People, wow, that's real life. 
So if I was a decent human being, absolutely, in a selfish society, they would be helped. I think they would be helped more and better than we do today when we outsource our charity to the government or whatever. And then this question, would selfish people pursue charity? Yes, I think they would. They'd pursue it in a very focused way. They'd pursue it around the things that they valued, they cared. They wouldn't help everybody. They would make their help conditional on somebody turning their life around, finding a job, trying to do the best that they could do, like the neighbor. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll help you right now, but I expect you to go look for a job. I expect you to do what you can to make a living versus the blank you know, check that we issue people today, even through charities that, are, that don't follow through and don't make sure that people self-prove. So I think there would be charity. I think it would be different. But I think there would be. And uh, I think it would be a lot more productive than the welfare state in terms of actually helping people and getting people back on their feet. Why would people do it? People would do it again because of a love of life per se, a love of humanity per se, right? They wouldn't help people they didn't think deserved it. They would help people they did think they deserved it. What was the last part or have we covered everything? Um, is it moral to ignore those who are poor because they were born with disabilities or fell ill? Is it moral to ignore people that are poor sh and, and because they were born with disabilities? Sure, it's moral to ignore them. It doesn't mean you should ignore them. But if somebody else's kid is born with a disability, it's not a claim against my life. It doesn't mean now I am somehow morally obliged to help. I might choose to help, but it doesn't place an obligation. Somebody else's troubles don't place a moral obligation on you. For example, if my neighbor, the story with my neighbor, if I don't have any money right now, I'm not helping my neighbor. If my kid is going to college and I have to pay his college tuition, I'm not helping my neighbor. Right, if I don't have enough money to do both. So everything is conditional on my life. So I might choose to help a poor family where a kid is, um, you know, is, is, uh, is born with, a, with a, a disability. But it's not an obligation for me to do so. Other people's problems are not a claim against you. This is what self-interest means. Your life is yours. And you get to choose how to make decisions about that life. In capitalism, if a child is born with disabilities, first of all, he's got parents. And since we're all richer, the parents are richer than they would be today. So mostly they can take care of that child. Second, you've got charity. You've got family. You've got wider networks of people close to that child who might choose to help him. It's not everybody's responsibility. It's, just, it's the choice of some people to do so. It's not an obligation. Anybody warmed up enough for a question? Yeah. What do you, okay, so how do we make capitalism sustainable? What does sustainable mean? What does the word mean? Make it last. I don't think you have to make capitalism sustainable. I think it is, right? Once we embrace it and are committed to it, then it's the most sustainable system in human history. What makes capitalism sustainable is the fact that it is constantly producing profits. Those profits are constantly reinvested into the capitalist system, and it's constantly growing and growing and growing. There's no cap. There's no limit on human growth. There's no limit on how far that process can happen. There's nothing that makes it unsustainable. You know, people say, yeah, but you run out of, I don't know, resources. But, but we never do. Why don't we run out of uh, resources? Like, let's say, let's say over the next 30 years, we run out of, let's say we run out of, uh, I don't want to use oil because that's too much of a, uh, what's something we use every day? Paper. Oh, how would you run out of paper? God. I mean, let's say you run out of paper. We lose some of the technology to make paper. I don't know why, because trees are still going to be there, right? So we run out of paper. So what do we do? Do we? Yeah. Yeah, somebody would innovate a way for us to write on, and they already have, right? You can write on your computer. You can write on a digital screen. Or 
you would make paper for something other than trees or whatever it is that makes it possible to make paper right now. The only limitation on resources is the human mind, human imagination, human innovation. Human, that's it. There's nothing unsustainable about capitalism. Indeed, our, our wanting to restrict capitalism makes our economies unsustainable. What is unsustainable is socialism. As Margaret Thatcher said, socialism very quickly runs out of other people's money to redistribute. Because it's all about redistribution of money from some people to other. At some point, these people are going to run out. You won't have anything to redistribute. But capitalism is a self-perpetuating machine because it's constantly creating wealth out of nothing. That's the beauty of it, right? I mean, this is out of nothing. I mean, it's got millions of components, but every one of those components by itself is worthless. It's the integration of them into this thing, which created wealth that didn't exist before, created utility that didn't exist before. And we constantly are making stuff like this, and we have been for thousands of years. That's the perpetuation, and for that you need capitalism. So what do I think of anti-monopoly laws? I think monopoly stifle competition. I think the anti-monopoly laws are probably the most immoral laws we have in the books. If I were ever put in a position of power, which I never will be, so don't worry, I would eliminate anti-monopoly laws probably first. Um, this is how anti-monopoly laws work. And if there are any lawyers in the room, they can either confirm or deny what I'm about to say. If, um, if you... Uh, charge a very high price, and you have a big profit motive, pro profit um, margin. You're a monopolist because if you weren't a monopolist, then you know you couldn't charge a big profit margin. Because if you take an economic 101, which about a third of is useless stuff you teach that you learn. Um, sorry, econ professors, but it's reality. Uh, the whole section on perfect competition and monopoly should be scrapped from every textbook in the books because it's absolutely 100% useless, completely useless, because this is what they teach. If you make a big, a big profit margin, you must be a monopolist. And therefore, we go after you, anti-competitive laws, we, 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 we prosecute you. If you price your product below your competitors significantly, then what are you doing? You're dumping, you know, you, 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 I forget the technical term, uh, you know, predatory pricing. You're predatory pricing. And we go after you with anti-monopoly laws. You're trying to grab, uh, grab market share uh, illegitimately. Right? And if you price your product at exactly the same price as your competitor, what's the problem with that? You're obviously colluding. And we go after you with anti anti-competitive laws are laws that can be applied to every single business in the United States at any given point in time at the complete discretion of the bureaucrat in charge. Right now, we have Lena Khan, who is hates business, broadly hates business, believes in the model of perfect competition, which is the most bizarre, detached from reality model ever invented by economists. And therefore, she's going after every business in the world. She's going after everybody big because, you know, why waste time on small stuff? She's going after everybody. And every time she goes after somebody anti-competitive, she comes up with a different excuse on why. But the reality is there's always competition in a free market. Now, granted, our market is not that free, but in a free market. If you, if you price your products, quote, too high, what will happen? People will enter the market. There's a huge profit opportunity. And they'll grab market share from you. And there'll be competition. Even if there's no competition today, they will raise venture capital and they will grab it. Why doesn't Google charge you for search? Google, Google for antitrust reasons, which is bizarre, right? Because how much do you pay for search? Zero. So who's exactly suffering from the Google monopoly over search? Not us. People who advertise may be paying too high advertising rates. We're trying to protect them, the advertisers. That's who we're trying to protect. Why do we care? And advertising, you can advertise on television, on radio. 
You can advertise on a number of different websites and different places. Google doesn't dominate the advertising space. But why doesn't Google charge you for search? Because if they started charging for search, what would you do? You'd immediately go to Bing or ChatGPT, which is going to eat Google alive anyway, right? Or the Google version of ChatGPT. There's no way that Google can afford to charge for search and not lose huge amounts of customers to its non-existent competitors. We're told they don't have competition for search. But suddenly, the competitors will show up, believe me. You know, a, a great example of this is in 1870s, 1870s, um, Rockefeller, Standard Oil, had 92% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. 92%. If ever there's been a, quote, monopolist, this is it. Right? Now, what does your economic theory tell you that he should have done while he was a monopolist? What would happen to prices? You owe 92% of a product segment. What do you do to prices? They go up, down, or stay the same? Up. What happens to quality when you have a monopolist? It goes down. Go look at the data. Every year it went down, prices. Every year quality went up. Dramatically, not a little bit. Why? Two reasons. Rockefeller understood that if he did not lower prices, competitors would enter the market and take his 92%. And second, he realized that the more he lowered prices, the more uses oil would serve. The cheaper it became, the more ubiquitous it would become in our culture. And indeed, by the time the internal combustion engine came around, and there were competitions for what would fuel the automobile, oil was so cheap that it was an obvious choice. It didn't have to be that way, but that was Rockefeller's genius. Who ultimately competed Rockefeller out of his business? Because there was one business, what, what was in 1870s, what was oil being used for? 90% of the use for oil in 1870 was for what? Trains? No, trains were using coal. Wood. I think he wood before coal. Well, lighting. It was used for lighting. And by the way, this is how to remember, right? Rockefeller saved the whales. Rockefeller saved the whales because before they used oil for lighting, they used whale oil for lighting. But because he made oil so cheap, it was, it was inefficient to go out and kill whales to get their whale oil because you could get kerosene. It was called kerosene to light everything you needed. It became so cheap that everybody, for the first time in all of human history, everybody, including the poor, had the ability to light their homes. Who competed who competed him out of that business? Electricity. Thomas Edison. Now, what bureaucrat would have expected that? What, what circuit judge would have expected competition to come from somewhere completely different? Not from the oil industry, but from an innovator who was in inventing how to use electricity to light a light bulb. But that's the reality. Indeed, by the time Rockefeller's oil company was broken up, by anti-competitive monopoly laws, he only had 25% of the oil industry because so many competitors had arisen in the years in between. So there was always competition there. It was just a question of the opportunity for them to assert themselves. So I would get rid of it completely. I don't believe monopolies exist in a free market. The only real monopolies are monopolies granted by government, protected by government, that could use force to exclude competition like the post office in the United States by delivering first-class mail in the U.S., and you will go to jail. That is a monopoly. But there's no such thing as free market monopolies. They just don't exist, because there's always competition. Other questions? Well, you guys have more questions? Go for them. Um, what makes capitalism morally good and not just more productive or subjectively preferred by the poor and motivated individuals? So what makes capitalism morally good is the fact that it leaves individuals free to pursue their happiness. What makes capitalism morally good is it leaves individuals free to use their own judgment in pursuit of their own values in the ultimate pursuit of their own happiness. That it protects them from the one thing that threatens your judgment. 
If you're a rational being, what is the one thing that threatens your ability to reason, your ability to think, to, to, to be rational? What is the one thing I can do to you to make your mind irrelevant? What's that? Jail, but what, it, what does jail represent? What is jail the extreme case of? Force. Coercion. If I stick a gun to your forehead, what you think is irrelevant. You're going to do what I tell you. If I threaten that if you don't act in a particular way, you will go to jail, that whole part of life, you don't think about. You don't. Because you're going to go to jail if you do anything about it. So if I tell a business, this area, you're not allowed to research, you're not allowed to do anything about it. Nobody's going to think about that. That's it. So the one thing you want to extract from human society is force, coercion, violence, authority with a gun. That's what capitalism does. It extracts force from society by protecting individual rights and leaves us free to use our judgment, to pursue our values, and to achieve our happiness. And that's what makes it moral. Go for it. I've been so clear today that nobody has a question. You are a minarchist supporter of limited government. Given the record of government as chief of human rights and mass murders, why are you not an anarcho-capitalist? Is it fear that without political restrictions, corporations will use their power? No. Well, there's a sense in which that's true, but no. Um, I, I think the whole assumption of this question is wrong. First of all, there's no such thing, in my view, as anarcho-capitalism. There's anarchy, and there's capitalism, and the two don't mesh. Anarchy does not bring about capitalism. Anarchy brings about anarchy, and anarchy is force, violence, destruction. Capitalism is a system in which individual rights are protected, and you have to have an agency to protect them, and that is the role of government. The role of government is to protect those rights. I believe that in most of human history is being anarchistic. I think tribal societies were basically anarchy. Small groups with their own kind of police force and, and, and political entity fighting with one another and engaging with nonstop violence. If you ever read uh, Stephen Pinker's book, uh, Stephen Pinker has a number of really good books, one on the Enlightenment and one on uh, Better Angels of Our Nature. It's a really good book. And it's about the history of violence. And he shows how over the last two, thousands of years, we've become less and less and less violent. I mean, today, we might see in the news constant pictures of war and destruction and people dying. And yet people are dying less of war today than they were in the past. People are dying less from murder today than they were in the past. We, we keep getting told, particularly certain political leaders, there's carnage in the streets of America. And yet... We're pretty peaceful right now. We're pretty safe right now relative to almost every period in American history. And that is because of the ability of government to protect our rights and to protect us. When we don't have government, when we don't have a strong government that actually engages in the protection of rights, what you get is violence of all against all. And that is the history. That's the history of the world. We've been engaged in violence throughout all of our history. Murder was very common. And part of the reason there was murder was because there was no government to enforce laws against murder. The anarchists use Iceland as an example. Iceland in the Middle Ages and as, as an example of an, you know, some kind of anarcho um, ideal. But if you actually read what happened in Iceland, because there was no government, right? So there were no laws against murder. So I would kill, I, I would steal your horses. And you would get pissed off. So you'd kill my wife. So I would come and kill your kids. And then you'd come and steal my thing and burn my house and kill whatever. And then, I don't know, they'd form a council and we're going to form the council and the council would say, stop doing this, it really isn't nice, which is in a sense a form of government, but they couldn't enforce it. So they just had to wag their finger at it. I said, okay, so we won't do it anymore. But then I kind of regret agreeing to that because, hey, you burned my house and you killed my wife, so I'm going to kill you. And it goes on and on and on. And that's the history of Iceland. And that's anarchy. And that's what anarchy always boils down to. And it has to boil down to that. 
Anarchy is the rejection of the concept of individual rights. It's a rejection of a standard of individual rights by which we agree to live and which needs to be enforced by a monopolist. This is the only place where you have a monopoly. You have to force, because it's anti-market, because it's anti-reason, it needs to be controlled by a monopoly entity. Call it government. Now, can that monopoly abuse its power? Of course. But that's why we need to be vigilant about liberty. That's why we need to be vigilant about our freedoms. That's why we need to fight and make sure that that government behaves itself. Um, but the alternative is much worse. Much, much worse. I mean, how many of you want to live in Somalia right now? Somalia is anarchy. There's no government. There's private law, what the anarchists like to call private law, competing legal systems, and it's hell. It's hell. All right, I think they've run out of questions. It's up to you, or we'll call it a night. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you think the government, like as a monopoly, can run under this moral system of self-interest, where we embrace self-interest? Yeah. Yeah, the government's going to be doing a, a, a job that is inherently, thankfully, not necessarily self-interest, right? So how yeah. Do you think so I, I think here you need to have... A, a very strong constitution and a very strong legal system. One of the reasons America has done a, relatively speaking to other countries, such a good job uh, of governing is because we have a fairly good constitution. We have about as good a constitution as any country has ever had. And that constitution holds up even when almost everybody in the culture doesn't agree with it anymore. Like how many people today in America know what the constitution says and agree with it? I think it's a small minority. Even something as basic as free speech. Today, when you ask students your age if they agree with the principle of free speech, a majority doesn't. A majority wants hate speech laws. We can't have hate speech laws because we still have a constitution and we have a Supreme Court that sometimes, on occasion, actually respects that constitution. And a Supreme Court, which I believe today, today, has no understanding of the principles behind the constitution, but it can read. So it follows what it reads. It doesn't understand but they can follow what the simple words say. Right? But there's not a single Supreme Court judge on the Supreme Court today that understands the concept of individual rights, philosophically, morally, properly. They don't. But because you have this document, it doesn't matter if they fully understand it. They just have to read, follow the principles, and it's okay. It's not great, but it's okay. So you need a better constitution, even better than the one we have, and I think we can do that, not... In, not with the people we have right now, but theoretically we could do it. Um, and the reason it could be better today is we've had 250 years of experience, right? I mean, how did, how did the founders write the Constitution? They looked at human experience. They looked at what happened. They looked at what worked and what didn't work. They extrapolated from what worked and what they thought would be ideal, and they presented it. But, you know, that was before the Industrial Revolution. That was before capitalism. That was before we've had 250 years of communism and socialism and fascism and all kinds of things. Today, we know a lot more. So I would rewrite the Constitution in a way that was clear in terms of what you wanted and how you would, uh, how you would uh, preserve the freedoms of the individual and what are the actual threats to those freedoms. I mean, I, I, for one, would include in the Constitution four separations. Right now, we have one kind of separation of state from church. But I would strengthen that to include all ideas. The government should not be in the business of ideas. Second, I would have a separation of state from economics. The government should not have economic policy, should not have economic position, should not accumulate economic statistics, should not have economic policy. It should leave the economy to us. I think government should not be involved in education. It should be a separation of state from education, which is really a derivative from the idea of separating state from religion and ideas. And finally, I think given, you know, given the way the world works today, we need a separation of state from science. State corrupt science. State should not be investing in science. Science should be something that's privately funded, privately raised. And if you had a constitution with those four separations, and the separation of power that we have today, just more explicit, right? Because we've, we've moved far away from the founders' perspective of separation of powers. We have a presidency today that's far too powerful, a Congress that doesn't do its job, 
and a, judici and a judiciary that sometimes goes this way, sometimes goes that way, but is completely inconsistent. We need to have more clarity around each one of those. So you would have to write a proper constitution, and I think that's, that would guarantee that the government stayed out of our private lives and our religious lives, our, our lives of ideas, interfere in our economic lives, and we would be free, and you would guarantee, therefore, self-interest. You could pursue self-interest. Or not. Their choice, right? You don't have to pursue your self-interest in a capitalist economy. I always tell my socialist friends, if you want to be a socialist in capitalism, that's okay. You can get your friends together, you can go start a commune, to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability, all day long. You'll live miserable, horrible lives, but that's your mind. But there's nothing to prevent you as long as it's voluntary, as long as nobody's forced to be there, to start a commune and establish a communist little commune, you know, wherever you want. So that's the beauty of freedom. You're allowed to experiment. You're allowed to go and do some really, really stupid things. But more importantly, you're allowed to do smart things. You're allowed to pursue your own happiness. All right, anybody want to do a final question? We're going to call this a night. All right, call it a night. Thank you.